All right, everybody. Hey, welcome back. It's 9.58, and uh, we got a couple minutes till class time. This is Wednesday, May 6th. This is our uh, 10 a.m. to 10.50 Chapman Intro Philosophy class, so welcome back, everyone. Just get comfortable and uh, take a few moments, and we'll be ready to go right at 10. Another minute. Hey, Kaylee. Hi, William. <clears throat> Jessica, nice to see you there. All right, so it's pretty much 10. Good morning, everybody. Um, anyone that's watching and that's here in the live stream, feel free to say hi. I see, I see you guys that have already uh, done so. Nice to be here with you guys again. and. Um, we're just going to continue. We have a couple of more meetings, so let me just make sure everyone is clear about what, what's coming up. Obviously, your uh, second essays are due Monday, so you should be working on those. And uh, if you haven't already, I would say get started when you can, because it's hard to write a philosophy paper on very short notice. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> that's due Monday, and then I'll be grading it over next week. Hey, Brian. And then, um, then there's the final exam. I gave you guys the study guide questions for that, and uh, so you're already probably looking at it next week, Wednesday and Friday. We'll hold the review sessions for getting ready for the final. And uh, aside from that, we just have a couple of more lectures today, Friday, and uh, Monday. So this is one of the last three lectures. Then there's two review sessions, and then the final is on the 19th. And all of the important dates and time slots and so on, they're all listed in our syllabus, so you can easily find them there. But um, let me know if you ever need any clarification about any of that stuff. So that's just you know, quick reminder. No surprises. but um, you, know, you just have your second essay in the final, so I just want you to make sure you remember that. Uh, okay, so now what we are doing is we're finishing the class on one last final topic, which is the topic of life, the value of life, death, um, what makes life go well, what would make a human life go as well as it could go. And uh, we're, you know, as always, comparing different written accounts by philosophers over the different generations to try and answer this question or at least give a sensible response. What would make a human life go well? So our first author about that topic is the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. And um, I was just trying to break down for you guys his account of what makes a human life go well. He basically wrote a uh, famous book called The Republic. And in The Republic, he gives an account of what would make for the ideal human society, what would be the best human type of state that people could live in. So he has this vision of like a utopian society, which he calls the Republic, and then what he does is he uses the elements of that description of the ideal society in order to, dis to uh, explain what he thinks the best human life would be for an individual. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit of refresher, a little summary or review of last week, or sorry, last Monday, last meeting. He says, okay, so first off, the Republic gets divided into three big parts, and uh, here were the three parts. You had one class of society which you call the merchants. The merchants are the biggest group in society. It's all the people that just work uh, a trade or a craft who produce goods or services and either trade or sell them for profit. So it's all the working people trying to make money, um, trading their wares, trading their skills, selling their goods. Now the second part of the republic with a different function are the uh, warriors. <clears throat> And the warriors are basically like the equivalent of 
uh, military and police. Their job is to provide security, defense against external threats and internal instability. So their job is not to sell goods and services and profit off of them, but instead to offer their capacity to you know, physically defend the Republic. And then the third group, which is perhaps the most important of all, were the kings. And kings are just the equivalent of the leadership class of society. So like presidents, prime ministers, monarchs, heads of state, Congress people, the ones who institute the policies, the ones who parts of the Republic, there's a virtue that goes along with each part. A virtue is a quality that if a, if a thing has it, then it will be able to perform its function excellently well. So the kind of uh, uh, attribute that would make a thing very good at its task or its job or its function. So for the merchants, the virtue was uh, to have temperance. Basically, people that want to make money and profit and off of the sale or trade of their goods and services should be willing to have a little bit of self-control. That's what temperance is. So self-control and moderation with respect to your appetites. If the merchants are good merchants, then they should make profit, but they shouldn't try to be so greedy that they end up engaging in fraud or corruption or something like that. Next up, the warriors. If they're going to be good and capable warriors, good defending and uh, fighting forces, then they have to have courage. Courage is the virtue of being able to face danger when it's needed. And so if they were not courageous, then they would not be good at defense because they'd be too scared to perform their job. And then third of all, the kings. Since they are the leaders and the ones that have to decide on the policies, they should have the virtue, the quality of wisdom. Wisdom means that you're um, good at making plans, that you're also good at long range judgments. So we want to have leaders in place that are smart basically and wise. If they are not, then they are not going, not going to make good decisions which would lead the Republic into its own self-destruction. Okay, so when you have these temperate merchants, courageous warriors and wise kings, all of them working according to their own virtue and not overstepping their boundaries, not trying to do the work of other parts of the soul, uh, but only their own job, and the lower parts of the soul willfully submitting to the rule of the kings instead of trying to overthrow or subvert his rule. That's when the society, the Republic, is working well and is in its highest condition. So he says that's the kind of harmony and balance that you want among the parts of the Republic. Have each part doing its job, but not any other part's job, according to their virtue, and in willful submission to the right ruler of the king. Now, okay, that is supposed to provide us with a model to describe what the best individual human life would be. Because the way Plato thought was that the soul and the state are parallel. The state is like a much larger version of the soul, and the soul is like a microcosm of the state. So what he thought was that the human soul is also divided among three parts of it in a way that's very much similar to the division of parts in the Republic. So that's what I'm going to put next on the board. We talked about the three parts of the Republic. Now we're going to extend that discussion by mentioning the three parts of the human soul. All right. <clears throat> so, you know, the ancient Greeks, they believed in the human soul. They believed, you know, that we have a soul, we have this immortal soul. And um, they thought that the soul had a structure inside, that it's also built out of three basic parts. So what are the three parts of the soul? First of all, there's the appendage part. Now, um, the appendage part of your soul is the part of your being that has appetites. So appetitive, the word appetite is the root. And that's what that part of your soul is. It's the part of you that has desires. That right? They could be appetite for possessions, for specific experiences, for certain types of relationships. Um, so whatever under the sun that you may want right now, whether it's um, you know a specific type of consumer product, specific type of uh, a consumable good, or a vacation of some kind, or a concert, or like you know whatever it is that you could possibly want when you desire things and you wish or want them to have to happen or to have them. Those are appetites. So that's one part of your soul. And what he thinks is that the appetitive part of your soul is roughly similar 
or comparable to the merchant class of the society. So I'm going to put in parentheses above the name of the part of the soul, the part of the republic that it is supposed to correspond with. So the appetitive part of your soul is basically roughly similar to the merchants. And why are those two things being compared? Because um, the merchants, in their role within society, have a desire to profit, you know, to make money basically and wealth off of the trade or sale of their goods. And so um, that is the key feature which aligns them with the appetitive part of the soul, the desire for profit and wealth. The appetitive part of you is much similar because it's a desire for things in general. So that's one part of your soul, just like how the merchants are one part of society. Next up, another part of the soul is the spirited part. Okay, so the spirited part of the soul is, um, it's the part of you that has a lot of passion and pride. It's the competitive part of you that, uh, that likes to win, hates to lose, um, hates to be disrespected. It likes to exhibit skill. So it's the part of you that, I don't know, if you were playing a sport, it would be the aspect of you that's getting competitive and that's really driving you to try and um, succeed and win in the game. If you ever, let's say, felt the need to defend yourself or important values that you have or other people that you value, then the spirited part of you is the part that would inspire you to some type of um, action necessary to protect yourself or others or values that you care about. So that's the competitive part of you, the proud part of you, the part that doesn't like to be dishonored. Um, and that part of you is somewhat uh, roughly comparable to the warriors in the Republic. Blues would not want to be disrespected or dishonored, and they're willing to um, act in the defense of themselves or others or important values. So that's the spirited part of you, comparable to the warriors. And then third, the all-important third part of the soul is the rational part of your soul. And that part is parallel to the kings in the Republic. So one part of your soul is the intellect, the intelligent part, the reasonable part, the part that sets passion and desire aside and just makes good, reasonable decisions about what the best, wisest course of action would be. That part of you is kind of like the kings who preside over the whole society. So the rational part within you really should be appointed to a position of leadership and authority. It's the part of you that should be leading your life and controlling your behavior. Just like the kings should be the ones that preside over society and make all of the important decisions about what happens and what direction things should go, what policies should be implemented, the rational part of you should be in the driver's seat. Within. There's also claimed to be a virtue for each of the three parts of the soul. And the virtue of each of the three parts of the soul is exactly the same as the virtue with the correlative part of the republic. So the virtue of the appended part is once again temperance, moderation, self-control. The virtue of the spirited part is yet again, sorry, I'll put that, just make sure we're clear. The virtue of the spirited part is courage. And the virtue of the rational part is wisdom. So um, as with the parts of the Republic, the parts of your soul should exhibit the virtue that is relevant to them. So when it comes to your appetites and your desires, that's a fine thing. And you should have appetites and you should seek the fulfillment of those appetites. But at the same time, you should not allow them to become so powerful that they overwhelm your better judgment and you have no self-control or moderation. So you should have appetites, but you should be able to keep them in check so that you don't pursue them against the better judgment of your reason, okay? Now, the spirited part of you that's competitive, that doesn't want to be disrespected, that's willing to fight if needed, um, that part of you should be courageous uh, because in case you ever need to take action um, to defend yourself, others, important values, to um, restore honor after having been slighted or disrespected, then that's the part of you that should be capable of acting even in face of some type of risk. 
So the spirited part of you, just like the warriors who are called into service to defend a country, they have to be brave and courageous enough to do that without being paralyzed by fear into inaction. You know, it's not a good fighting soldier or police officer that's too scared to do their job. And it's not a good spirited element within you, the competitive and um, sort of prideful aspect of you, if it's not courageous enough to do the things necessary in life that may be called upon. And then the third part of you is the rational part, which is like the kings. Um, if that part is going to be good at its job, being reasonable and being the leader, then it has to be wise. Nobody wants to live in a society where the leadership of the society are, are ignorant, um, stupid, um, or, or just plain dumb. So you don't want that either for your rationality. It has to have wisdom or else who's making decisions for you? Um, you know, you need, you need a part of you inside that's wise enough to make correct decisions and not unduly influenced by uh, the power of your desires or your passions. Okay, so when the three parts of your soul work according to their virtue, when they stay in their own lane and they don't try to do the job of the other parts, and when, importantly, the lower parts of the soul defer to the king, defer to the reason within you, willfully submit to its leadership and rule, and don't try to overthrow it, then your soul is in a good state, just like the Republic would be in a good situation if it had the same kind of parallel harmony and balance. So that's what he thinks causes a good human life. You want your life to go well? Then here's the recipe from Plato's perspective. Try to get the three different parts of your soul to cooperate. Try to get them to each display the virtue, which is relevant to their part. And make sure that they all submit peacefully to the proper rule of your reason and do not try to, let's say, uh, gain supremacy or power or control over you. Let the lower parts do their job but not try to take leadership over the reason. Now, that would be a good human life. The same with this republic. A republic that's not doing well is one where the parts of the republic are stepping outside of their boundaries to take more influence than they should. Like, say you had a competitive uh, merchant class that um, had no degree of moderation, then they might end up engaging in fraud, abuse, and corruption uh, in order to increase their profit margins at the expense of the consumers. And they may even then try to influence the levers of power in government to conduce to their greater advantage, but to the instability of the society as a whole. And that would not be a very good and flourishing society. So they got to stay in their lane and not try to take over. Say you had a society where there was a military coup. Basically, the soldiers and the military overthrow uh, the wise leadership and now try to take power in that way. But spirited warriors are not wise and rational policy makers and planners. So if they take that power, they're going to also make bad decisions because they don't have the wisdom that makes them capable of ruling. Um, and that's the way that the Republic would go to its own ruin. And your own soul would similarly be harmed the lower parts of it took too much power and stepped outside of their lane. So here I'll read to you uh, what he says in, about these points. He says, um, right at the beginning on 743, we are agreed that the same number and the same kinds of classes as are in the city are also in the soul of each individual. <clears throat> this is Socrates talking to Glaucon, Plato's older brother. So at times Glaucon steps in and says, yes, yeah, true. So that's true. Socrates continues. Therefore, it necessarily follows that the individual is wise and in the same part of himself as the city. That's right. And isn't the individual courageous in the same way and in the same part of himself as the city? And isn't everything else that has to do with virtue the same in both? Yes. Moreover, Glaucon, I suppose we'll say that a man is just in the same way as the city. That is true. And we surely haven't forgotten that the city was just because each of the three classes in it was doing its own work. I don't think we could forget that. Then we must also remember that each one of us in whom each part is doing its own work will himself be just and do his own, of course. Therefore, isn't it appropriate for the rational part to rule since it is really wise and exercises foresight on the behalf of the whole soul and for the spirited part to obey it and be its ally? Yes. Um, so he says, um, then he talks about the, um, 
the spirited and the appetitive parts. He says, isn't it, as we were saying, a mixture of music and poetry on the one hand and physical training on the other that makes the two parts harmonious? Stretching and nurturing the rational part with fine words and learning, relaxing the other part through soothing stories and making it gentle by means of harmony and rhythm. And these two, the rational and the um, spirited part, having been nurtured in this way and having truly learned their own roles, will govern the appetitive part, which is the largest part in each person's soul and is by nature most insatiable for money. They'll watch over it to see that it is not filled with the so-called pleasures of the body and that it does not become so big and strong that it no longer does its own work but attempts to enslave and rule over the other classes until that it is not fit to rule, thereby ruining everyone's life. Yes. Then wouldn't these two parts also do the finest job of guarding the whole soul and body against external enemies, reason by planning, spirit by fighting, and following its leader and carrying out the leader's decisions through courage. Okay? So basically what he's saying is that in the Republic, sometimes you're going to have to have the kings and the warriors act together to curb the overactive desires of the merchants. Um, and that's also true of your soul. Sometimes your reason, acting together with your spirited nature, will have to turn back the over uh, excessive demands of your appetites. But when they do that, and when reason is allowed to rule, and not overthrown or challenged by the inferior parts or the lower parts of the soul, then your life is going well because the parts are balanced, the proper element within you is appointed to leadership, and none of them are fighting with each other or in a state of tension, or conflict. So that's what he thinks would lead to a good human life. Um, now, some people might say to you, uh, well, let's get to that in a moment. Here's what he says next. Bad behavior, unjust behavior, where does it come from? It comes from imbalance and disharmony among the different parts of the soul. Where does just and correct and righteous behavior come from? It comes from the type of balance and harmony which he has argued that we should try to uh, establish. So like, let's get into that. Why, he says, would a person ever commit theft? You know, he says if you had the proper type of balance that he's defining and explaining here, you would never commit theft because theft happens. Fraud, theft, embezzlement, those kind of things only happen when one of the lower parts of the soul's soul uh, gains too much power and authority, more than it should, tries to take over and become the leader. So which part of you do you think would have become overactive if you ended up committing an act of theft? You know, so you stole something that did not belong to you. If somebody did that, which of these three parts of the soul do you think would be uh, getting a little bit too, um, I don't know, overactive? To commit theft, which part of the soul, you see him up on the board, would be the one that's becoming a little too strong? It's the appetitive part, okay? William, so think about what is theft. Theft is that you want something and you're not willing to just earn money to gain it. Uh, so when your appetites are too strong and your reason is telling you, but hold on, you can't just steal it. I mean, you gotta wait until you got the money or at least find a way to get it as a gift or something. That's what your reason would tell you, right? Because it's never reason like intellect that says, yeah, the smart thing to do here is just to commit theft, you know, be a thief. It's your appetites that tell you, forget your better judgment. You want it, so you better just take it. Right? So the appetitive part, when it becomes way too strong and it doesn't listen to what's wise or reasonable, it does bad stuff. Okay, So that's why people commit theft. It's not because reason dictates that to them, like this is just the intelligent and wise choice. It's just a desire that they can't seem to turn back. It's a desire that they can't seem to delay the gratification of uh, as their reason would have told them to do. So theft and other kind of bad behavior like that it doesn't come from a justly and well-ordered soul. It comes from a soul that's out of order, where the appetitive part has gained too much power and strength, more than it ought to, when it's trying to act like it's the leader instead of the reason within you. And so here's what he says about that. Um, so <clears throat> if we had come to an agreement about whether someone similar in nature, in nature and training to our city had embezzled a deposit of gold or silver that he had accepted, who do you think would consider him to have done it rather than somebody who is not like him? Glaucon says nobody. So what he's saying there is like, would you really think a person with a just soul would have committed theft or somebody without one? He says nobody would say a just individual would do that. 
Furthermore, would he have anything to do with temple robberies, thefts, betrayals of friends in private life or cities in public life? No, he would never do that because in order to do that, you would have to have an appetite that was out of control. But a person whose soul is just does not have an out of control appetite. They have an appetite which is curbed by temperance and guided by reason. Um, let me ask you another question. What if a person did this kind of thing? Someone cut him off on the road, you know, uh, maybe they didn't like the way the person drove, they thought it was a little rude and inconsiderate, so they became angry. And uh, instead of just letting it go, the anger consumes them, and they follow this person with their car until eventually they park, and they park behind them and they get out and they just beat them silly, like road rage incident. Okay, now, maybe we can all hopefully agree that that's not the right thing to do, and that's probably a poor and unwise choice. So I don't think it's wisdom within you that's telling you you must attack this person. But which part of the soul do you think in that case would be getting too powerful? You know, becoming a little overactive and stepping beyond its proper role. Which part of the soul is becoming supercharged, beyond normal, beyond what's proper, when you commit this act of assault from road rage? That would be a case where which part of your soul has gained too much power? The road rage example. Now that is the spirited part, exactly, yes. So. Could the person have suffered the disrespect and the dishonor of having been treated un, you know, in, impolitely on the road? Sure. And if they had listened to their better judgment, their reason would have said, the more important thing here is to you know, um, forego the satisfaction of your passions here in order to do the thing that's all things considered better for you and everybody else. When a person does that, it's not like they said, you know, I deliberated over it rationally. I just made a calm and measured decision that I needed to commit assault. Instead, it's like they'll say this in court when people challenge them on their motives. They'll say, okay, look, it wasn't good, but I was just so angry. I had anger management issues. You know, I can't control my powerful passions and emotions. Sometimes they lead me into bad behavior, which I later regret later on thinking I should have just been calm and rational about the whole thing. So you don't want to live a life like that either, right? And so you need to kind of allow your spirited part to be under the control of your reason, not to be in control of everything you do. Your behavior should be based on the judgment of your wise, reasonable part. So if the lower parts of your soul have too much influence and they try to take over, it's going to lead you into unjust, vicious, and bad behavior that's both to your own disadvantage and, of course, to everyone else's disadvantage too. So why would you do that? You shouldn't want to do that. But that's the cost that comes from an unjust life. Um, so let me then read what he says on that. <clears throat> Adultery, disrespect for parents, neglect of the gods, all of those would be more in keeping with the unjust character. And isn't the cause of all this that every part within the just person does its own work, whether it's ruling or being ruled? So are you looking for justice to be something other than this? And Glaucon says no. Then the dream we had has been fulfilled. Our suspicion that, with the help of God, we hit upon the origin and pattern of justice right at the beginning of the founding of our city. Okay, so um, that's the way that one should try to lead, lead the best human life. Organize and harmonize the different parts of your soul. Make sure that reason is the leader, that it's running the show, that it's the captain of the ship. Have the other parts doing their important roles, but only in accordance with the virtue that is relevant to them uh, and have them working as a sort of harmonious functioning unit where each part does its job for the sake of the benefit of the whole soul um, but they don't try to let's say overstep their boundaries okay so after that there's another question which is given okay so I guess we've kind of given a basic description here of the ideal human life Balance and harmonize the parts of your soul. Get each one doing its job according to its virtue and have them all willfully submitting to the rule of your reason inside. But here's another question, okay? So follow up from there. And this is what play, sorry, what Socrates asks Glaucon next. Socrates asks this question. What if you could uh, be unjust? What if you could do unjust things, but nobody would ever find out about it and you'd never get caught? basically. Could injustice benefit you if nobody knew about it? So question. Think about that and see. Can you give me what you think might be your answer? Like, suppose that you could do things that are not just, but we eliminate the possibility that you could ever, ever be caught doing it. So there will never be accountability coming from outside. 
Like imagine a person thinks, maybe I'll plagiarize on a, on a school assignment. Well, what if that plagiarism will never be caught? Do you think that that would benefit the plagiarizer as long as they don't get caught doing unjust bad things? Do you think that the only harm to the individual is the accountability that they may face? Or do they not be benefited? So does unjust behavior benefit a person if they don't get caught? Yes or no? Can a person benefit from unjust behavior under the circumstance that they will not be discovered having done it? So you know, they commit theft, but this is a case of theft which will never ever be discovered. <clears throat> okay, so Jessica, you're saying in the short term it would benefit them, but in the long term it would not. Okay, I see your response. You're thinking that in a sort of superficial sense, they get the benefit of whatever the outcome is that they were trying to obtain through the unjust behavior. But maybe in some long range sense, that's not actually to their deeper self-interest. Here's what William says, in the long run, their unjust behavior will bond them. Okay, maybe. And you're saying Jessica, it's still a bad action, whether or not you're caught, good, Brian. No, they'll harm their own self uh, to live a good life. And Caesar, I don't think so because it is the, in the long term it will hurt them more. What do you guys mean when you say in the long term it will hurt them more? Because I'm giving you a hypothetical in which they will never be caught in the long term either. So imagine that this person will permanently escape detection from their pattern of bad behavior. And they'll go to the grave never having ever been noticed by any other person having done anything bad. But they did do those bad things. It's just that nobody knew it. Uh, so like, you know, a case of a person who stole a bunch of stuff, nobody ever knew about their theft. Throughout their whole life, they just kept getting away with it and they went to their grave undetected. Do you understand the hypothetical? I'm not just talking about a one-off case. Okay, so William, you say, because I think a lot of unjust behavior is dependent on situations. So if their situation won't allow them to benefit, although unjust, means then they're screwed. Perhaps. Um, but I mean, we're asking it in a hypothetical sense, right? Like, I know in real life, when you do bad things and you don't get caught, you feel like, okay, I was rewarded by that, so it gives me an incentive to continue. And then if you keep persisting in that pattern, eventually you will be caught. Perhaps that's what you guys think when you think getting away with it today, but you might not get away with it over and over again in the long run. And so it would be better for you not to go down that road. But we're asking the question, what if in theory you would never get caught? Would you still be benefited by it? Uh, so let me just give you Plato's answer. And I think some of you guys are getting to the same kind of conclusions that he does, but on a different basis. Brian say, but subconsciously they'll know themselves that it isn't the right way to live. True. And that's also touching on his way of thinking about this. So let's go into it now. I like having those discussions. Um, but here's how he thinks about this question. You might not be surprised. He says, no, you don't benefit. Even if nobody in the world ever finds out about it, it is not to your self-advantage. It's to your disadvantage to commit unjust acts. Whether or not anybody finds out about it, you're going to pay a price. So um, here's the point he makes. He says, when you do unjust behavior, whether or not anybody finds out about it, the price you pay is that you harm your soul inside. You're corrupting and damaging your soul and the internal con constitution of it when you commit bad behavior. So you may think because there's no social accountability, because there's no penalty that others impose upon me, I'm not jailed, I'm not disliked, I'm not discovered, that's the only harm. But he says, no, there's an internal harm that even if nobody knows about it, it still is happening. And that is the corruption and the destruction of your soul inside. So. Um, Caesar, let me get your question or comment. For example, if you plagiarize, you might benefit in the short term, but because you won't have to work hard, uh, because you won't have to work hard, but in the long term, you won't learn, and that won't benefit you. True. Um, that's one type of example. Um, what Plato is going to do here is generalize from the existence of such individual examples to the bigger picture why overall nobody ever benefits from any unjust action, whether it was the plagiarism case or the theft case or, you know, cheating um, in another way, like in a relationship or anything else. So um, let me tell you one little thing about a myth that is sometimes described by the Greeks that is often referenced in the same mention here on this topic. There was a myth back then called the Ring of Gyges. And um, according to this ancient myth, there was a mythical ring. If you could find this legendary ring of Gyges and you could put it on, it would cloak you with invisibility. So basically with the ring on, nobody could see you. And you can move around cloaked by invisibility, no one knowing where you were at. Now imagine that you had this type of ring. Clearly you'd be tempted to do all kinds of things, right? I mean, you could easily steal and no one can catch an invisible thief. 
you could, I don't know, eavesdrop and obtain surveillance on information that you're not authorized to know about. Um, you could trespass and blah, blah, blah. So you can do all kinds of things that no one would ever know about. So you could also ask this question in that way. If you could put on this ring and do a bunch of stuff that you shouldn't do and no one know about it, would that be to your benefit? So look, here's his reason. He says, no, you're not going to benefit from that. Uh, because what happens when you behave unjustly is that even if no one else can see or know, um, you're damaging the soul inside. So he tries to explain it by means of a visual metaphor. This visual metaphor is uh, chosen by the author Plato and as we've seen in philosophy, a lot of times creative examples are given to illustrate a concept. And so here we have another case like that. The example given is of like a three-headed creature. Okay, so just bear with me as I try to draw, if I can, this, this three-headed creature that he mentions. So, so let me just, first of all, we'll put the point that this is illustrating. Um, so question was this. Does unjust behavior benefit you if nobody knows about it? Okay, and you know, Plato's answer, the Greek ancient answer, no. But why? Okay, well, here, take this example, three-headed creature. Okay, so here is a creature. I'm going to do this. Now, this creature has got three different heads. One of the heads is... So it's, it's a little tricky to describe, but it's not exactly just one head. The one is like a section of many little snapping gargoyle heads. So this is the section, and it's got like a bunch of these little guys. Now, what are these little things on this side? They're all described as like little monstrous little gargoyles that are hungry. Snapping, snapping, feed me, feed me. I want to eat something. Okay, so that's their deal. Over here, another of the three is simply like the head of a lion. Now you guys have seen that I have a cat, but I'm not the best, I guess, at drawing such things. So let's just pretend, okay, that this is like a perfect visual demonstration of a lion's head over there, okay? And then the third one is simply a typical human head, like me and you. Okay? So we got the three-headed creature there. What are they? Section of gargoyles, lion, and then the human. Okay, now each of these three parts of the three-headed creature, each of the three heads, is supposed to be a symbol of one of the three parts of the soul that we all talked about. Okay, so now, snapping gargoyles that are like feeding me right now, which part of the soul do you think that they're supposed to stand for? The gargoyle section of heads you got a th three options. Is it appetitive, spirited, or rational? I think you'll be able to get this one pretty good. That's the appetitive part, correct, Jessica? Yeah, so that's the part of the soul that wants things, that's desiring. That's symbolized by their appetite for food in this case, okay? Now, the noble lion, you know, the proud lion, king of the jungle. Which part of the soul do you think that is supposed to symbolize? This lion head? Probably you can deduce. It's the spirited part, right? Because, you know, lions are proud, they're... Uh, you know, they have a lot of physical ability and they can defend. Now, the third part, the human, that's obviously the rational part because a human being is, you know, infinitely more intelligent and uh, intellectually skilled than either a non-human lion or these little gargoyles which have the single thought E. Okay, so now, he says this. Imagine that this three-headed creature, that's how it is on the inside, these three heads. But on the outside, all that outside, Outsiders, third persons can see is which one of those three heads. From the outside looking in, everybody just sees which one of the three. You can take a guess. So inside, that's the picture. That's the reality inside. But to outsiders who observe, they merely see one of them, and it is just which one you think. The human one, right? Yes, exactly, Caesar. So to an onlooker, 
it's a simply normal looking human face. Hi, how are you? Kind of like any of us. But he says, I want you to imagine that this is what's actually going on within the person, okay? Inside, what nobody can see, but what is actually going on behind the scenes, suppose, is that all these like gargoyles, they're snapping at the human head, lashing out towards him, getting dangerously close to biting his head and stuff. And so he's cowering in terror and fear away from this hungry, hungry set of little snapping gargoyles. But even as he's recoiling in terror from them, the lion is threatening him from the other direction and nipping at him and trying to bite him up from that side. So the human being within this situation has been dominated and enslaved by the other parts. It's been controlled by their overreaching power. And so it's now basically going to be forced to be dragged along wherever either of the other two parts leads. And so even if nobody else knows that that's the real situation inside, that is the way the person is living inside when the soul is disordered and unjust. So he says, this is the price that you're going to pay if you think I should just do a bunch of unjust behavior and try to get away with it. And as long as I get away with it, no, no disadvantage will, will come to me. What you're actually doing is you're enslaving and making weak the human rational part of you inside. And you are empowering and elevating beyond what is proper and healthy the inferior parts of your soul that are not wise. So now you're simply being led through life by overpowerful desires and passions. And that's not going to be to your advantage. Take, for example, like, I don't know, a really hardcore drug addict, right? Who is going to pursue the satisfactions of the psychological uh, alteration of consciousness that the drug creates, even at the expense of their better judgment, right? So people definitely live like that. And oftentimes, someone who's really heavy into addiction can understand inside that reason would tell them, I should stop. You know, my rationality could say, this is a bad and an unhealthy set of decisions. But I can't do otherwise because my appetites are so powerful that they overwhelm my better judgment, right? Now, is that person actually living a good, healthy human life, even if nobody knows about their addictive tendencies? No because the parts of their soul inside are at war with each other and they're struggling for supremacy. It's like the appetites within them are vying for control over their behavior, whereas the reason should really be the one that's in the driver's seat. On the other hand, if a person, let's say, is emotionally unstable and they keep on getting into fights because they can't take any little slight disrespect and they're so volatile, in that case, that type of behavior is also unwise. And if they had simply listened to their better judgment, it would have advised against those behaviors. But, you know, even if they do those types of things um, and nobody knows about it, the cost they are paying inside is the corruption of their soul and the imbalance and disharmony among the parts. So he says, that's not how you should want to live. You're mistaken, therefore, if you have a false assumption that bad behavior that's unjust is fine as long as I don't get caught, it's still to my advantage. No, it is not to your advantage because even if no one in the whole world would ever know about those unjust actions. The soul that is inside is still being corrupted, and that objective fact means you're in a poor state, even if no one else is in a position to know about it. I think that this is interesting, and it's kind of ironic, because if what he's saying is true, and unjust behavior comes at a price, the cost of the health of your soul and the corruption of your soul, um, then... When you do behave unjustly and you harm your soul, you're doing something to yourself that no one else can do to you. Like, who can corrupt your soul? Not me, not anybody, only you. I can't go up to someone and impose that upon them, like, hey, you, your soul just got corrupted. You're welcome. I can't do that to somebody. You have to take decisions that undermine your own reason and rationality. And no one else can do that for you. So why would you want to harm yourself in this deep, and impactful and lasting way uh, that no one else could possibly do to you. That would not be to your best advantage. So let me read then, and you see how he puts it. He says, <clears throat> Someone said at some point that injustice profits a completely unjust person who is believed to be just. Isn't that so? Glaucon says yes. So let's discuss this with him, since we've agreed on the powers that justice and injustice have by fashioning an image of the soul in words, so that the person who says this sort of thing will know what he's saying. What sort of image? 
Well, one like those creatures that legends tell us used to come into being in ancient times, like the Chimera, Scylla, Cerberus, or any of the multitude of others, the legends do tell us of such things. So, fashion a single kind of multicolored beast with a ring of many heads that it can grow and change at will, some from savage and some from gentle animals, and that's the gargoyle section, okay? Glaucon says, that's work for a clever artist. However, since words are more flexible than wax, consider it done. Next, he says, then consider one other kind, that of a lion, and another of a human being. But make the first, the gargoyles, much the largest in size, and the lion second to it in size. He says, easy, sculpting is done. Now join all three of them into one so that they somehow grow together naturally, okay? Then, fashion around them the image of one of them, that of the human being, so that anyone who sees only the outer covering and not what is inside will think that it is a single creature, the human. He says, okay. Now, if someone tells you that injustice profits this human being and that doing just things brings no advantage, let's tell him first that he is simply saying that it is beneficial for you to feed this multiform beast and make it strong, and also the lion and all that pertains to him, and then second, to starve and weaken the human being within, so that he is dragged along wherever either of the other two leads, and third, to leave the parts to bite and kill one another, rather than accustoming them to each other and making them friendly. That's what somebody who praises injustice is saying. But on the other hand, wouldn't someone who maintains that just things are profitable be saying, that our words and deeds should all ensure that the human being within the human has the most control, that he should take care of the many-headed beast as a farmer does his animals, feeding and domesticating the gentle heads and preventing the savage ones from growing, and third, that he should make the lion's nature his ally, care for the community of all the parts, and bring them up in such a way that they will be friends with each other and with himself. So just behavior leads to a harmony and balance among the internal configuration of your soul. So you don't have that internal tension uh, where you know your appetites are tearing in a different direction from your reason, or your passion is trying to exert undue influence over your judgment. When you have a just and well-ordered soul, all the parts willfully submit to the proper rule of your reason and do not try to challenge it. But when you have an unjust soul that is conflicted by overly powerful appetites or passions in which your reason is actually actively suppressed, you're suffering inside. You're at a state of internal conflict. So you're not doing well and your soul is, is harmed. Therefore, he says this, which I think is a great quote. He says, if, if, if ever a person tells you, hey, just try to get away with things, you know, just cheat, lie, steal, and as long as no one finds out, you're going to be better off. He says, those people don't have your best interests in mind because what they're inviting you to do is to corrupt your soul, which is something you won't get back and which is the most deeply damaging and harmful thing that you can do to yourself is so self-destructive. So he says those people who pose as friends and say, just cheat, let's do this, and just get away with it so we can just get the benefit, they are telling you to corrupt your soul, and so they don't have your good interests in mind. There's, here's what he says. <clears throat> From every point of view, then, anybody that praises justice speaks the truth, and anybody that praises injustice is speaking false. And that is whether we look at the situation from the point of view of pleasure, good reputation, or advantage. A praiser of justice is telling the truth, and one who condemns it has nothing good to say and does not know what they're talking about. So you would be poorly served by listening to the counsel of unjust people telling you to follow in their pattern of behavior, because it's not just about getting away with it. There's something that happens to you inside when you develop a pattern of unjust behavior. You're weakening your reason and your intellect. And you're allowing the parts of you that are subhuman and godless to take control. He has one more example after that. He says, suppose that you had a loved one, like a daughter or a son, or maybe because you guys are very young, a parent or a sibling. What if there was some person, savage and evil men, that said, we want to take that loved one of yours away from you so we can torture them or do whatever we want to them. And we'll just give you as much money as you want. How much do you want? You just name the amount. We'll give it to you, and then we get to take that person. Now, do you think that that would profit you? If there was a way that you could, let's say, exchange your parent or child to torturers for an unlimited amount of money, you might say, okay, in a financial sense, but is your soul better off? Are you a better human being? Definitely, I think we can say no. And so he thinks the same is true of a person that sells out their reason for the greater satisfactions of their passions or appetites. Uh, and that's what he says here. So that'll be the last quote I read. He says, in light of this argument, can it profit anyone to acquire gold unjustly? If by doing so, he enslaves the best part of himself to the most vicious. If you got gold by enslaving your son or daughter to savage and evil men, it would not profit you 
no matter how much gold you got. How then could you fail to be wretched if you pitilessly enslave the most divine part of yourself to the most godless and polluted part and accept golden gifts in return for a more terrible destruction? So that's how he rests his case. Do you want to lead a good human life? According to the Greek ideal of Plato, you should be trying to harmonize and balance the parts of your soul, empower the reason within you, allow it to lead on like the king of a justified, a just republic would do. Um, each of the three parts of the soul has an important role to do, just like each of the three parts of the republic. So you hear that as my cat sneezing. Hey, kitty, sorry. So try to achieve the same balance that we see in the republic within the parts of your soul. And if you have the mistaken assumption that unjust behavior could be to your benefit or advantage, as long as it goes undiscovered, you're going to be uh, poorly served because what you're going to do is create this kind of internal situation where the human head has been enslaved and uh, dominated by the lower parts of you. You don't want to live that way. So to ensure the just and righteous uh, human life, the best life that you could live, try and achieve the paradigm which he describes in this, in this book, The Republic. Now, we got more to say on the value of human life and what makes a life go well. This is not the only view. This is not the only account. So on Friday, when we come back, we're going to compare this against the much different thought, which is given by the 20th century philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. So it's a much more modern and a lot of more um, subjective account of what makes a human life go well. For him, there's no one-size-fits-all universal um, approach. It's much more individualistic, according to Sartre. So that'll be a whole different look at uh, what makes a life go well. But now you've heard this Greek account, which is quite influential and is considered you know, uh, a classic throughout intellectual history of the West. And then on Monday, we have one more paper, which is Derek Parfit, and he also talks about you know, what he thinks will make a human life go well. So we've got two more essays. Uh, we're going to end with Parfit, and then Wednesday and Friday next week, we switch to review session for those study guide questions that I sent everybody. All right, then. So I guess we've reached the end for today's meeting. Um, as usual, really appreciate you guys' uh, attendance and contributions to the live chat. Um, take care, be healthy, and I will see you guys for sure on Friday. Let me know if there's anything else you need, um, and I'll be checking my emails you know, regularly. So have a good one. Bye-bye, guys. <clears throat>